Hi everyone, welcome to the tech talk of Demcon, breaking the power density world record. The next 30 minutes you're going to listen to Yves Lenaar, software engineer, and Gerard Oosterwegel, megatronic engineer of Demcon Eindhoven. You will learn more about one of the challenging projects of Demcon. So thank you for watching and enjoy the tech talk. Thank you, Marleen. So, Eve and I have worked on this project for uh, the last two years, uh, the Lighthouse project, where we actually broke the power density world record. This uh, was a couple months ago, at uh, the beginning of uh, 2022. It was published on uh, multiple news websites, for example, innovationorigins.com, where it says that uh, uranium-free medical isotopes are a breakthrough in nuclear medicine, meaning nuclear-free, is uh, the use without nuclear power stations. Uh, medical isotopes are used in uh, medicine, so hospitals, for uh, lots of patients. Um, we'll go more into this talk uh, for uh, the whole presentation, and we'll start with the customer and project goal. From there on, we will show you what, uh, how the setup has been uh, built up with the mechanical and system design. And from there, we go into the software and control. And for both of these, so the mechanical and system design and the software and control, we'll show uh, just a few technical challenges that we faced in the last two years. From there, we go to the experiments, uh, where we show at least three experiments that we did. And with the final one, we can go a little bit more into the world record that we have achieved. So let's start with the customer and project goal. Okay, so to explain where this medical isotope uh, is used for, I will give to, have to give an example. So currently, uh, people who are suffering from cancer, they need to be treated. And to be able to treat them, we have to trace uh, these um, cancer cells. And to be able to trace those cancer cells, we use SPECT imaging. The SPECT imaging is actually a 3D scan of the human body. But to be able to do this uh, SPECT imaging, we will have to add uh, tracing fluid. So this tracing fluid is then injected into the human body. To give an example, we currently uh, are talking about technetium-99, and two-thirds of all tracing fluids uh, consist of technetium-99, so it's widely used. Now, to explain how this uh, technetium-99 is generated, uh, in hospitals they have a generator which uh, extracts the technetium-99 from the molybdenum-99. So, uh, next to the technetium-99 on the left, you see the molybdenum-99, It is uh, transported to the hospitals and then gets generated and extracted to put into the human body, so the patients. So currently our customer, ERE, they have uh, nuclear reactors and in those nuclear reactors we fire neutrons onto the uranium target. So this uranium target then uh, gets split up and part of it becomes molybdenum-99. Uh, so currently this is how uh, ERE actually produces it. The challenge that we are now facing is that uh, supply is uh, running low because we only have a few uh, nuclear reactors on, on the planet. And we need to solve this issue by uh, de developing new ways to produce uh, this molybdenum-99. So a new way to, be, to produce this molybdenum-99 would be by using an uh, electron accelerator. So instead of the uh, nu nuclear reactor, we have an electron accelerator. So electrons are fired onto this uh, molybdenum-100 target. So the molybdenum-100 target then gets activated by the electrons and eventually becomes uh, molybdenum-99. The nice part about this method is that we can still have the existing procedure. So uh, we still create the same uh, molybdenum-99. So we can then use the same transport method to be able to eventually get this into the, the human body. So, and the other uh, good part is that we uh, get rid of the uranium uh, and we also have less nuclear waste, actually more than 90% less uh, nuclear waste, which is a good thing. And now to put this into practice, uh, our customer ERE designed uh, this factory. So this factory, factory is actually uh, the theory that I just explained put into practice. So the size of this factory is actually the size of a soccer field, which is really big. This is needed to eventually irradiate the target. Now next, you can see on the, in the bottom, uh, on the orange line, you see the electron beam. So this electron beam is generated from the electron accelerator. 
Uh, this electron accelerator uses three megawatts amount of power, so it's the equal amount of uh, 15,000 households, which is the same as a small village uh, that this electron accelerator consumes. Now the, this beam eventually goes to the right and then splits up into two parts. So eventually those two parts will come together again and then hit the molybdenum target. So we at Tempcon, we are actually focusing on this exposure cell. So this is where the, actually the two beams will come together and hit this target. So we can then eventually um, process the, the target uh, for, uh, to get us into uh, eventually uh, transport and then to the uh, hospitals. Yeah. But uh, of course, uh, we use three megawatts amount of power uh, and eventually the target is only the size of a small matchbox. So we have a saucer field of a factory and eventually a, a target of only the matchbox, which is uh, really tiny. And we put three megawatts amount of power into it. Uh, as you can uh, guess, the main challenge here is to actually cool this uh, target because two megawatts are deposited onto this target and this needs to be extracted from this target. So to solve this, we use sodium. So we cool the target with sodium. Uh, but uh, of course this is the main challenge, so to solve this challenge and prove that this principle works, we have to come up with a demonstrator. So Gerard will talk about us, this demonstrator. Yes, now this demonstrator, it has to be of course a lot smaller than the actual factory. Um, now the, the scale that we uh, anticipated for was about one to a thousand, so our target will be about a thousand times smaller than the actual factory. Um, but the key parameters had to be the same. So, for example, uh, the power density that was uh, that is absorbed by our target uh, should be equal to the factory, such that at least locally the parameters uh, physically do not change and that we uh, at least experiment with the right type. Uh, and next, the radiation damage should also equal locally the same as in the factory. So even though the factory is a lot bigger, about a thousand times bigger, uh, locally our physical parameters are uh, equal. Um, so the, eventually the goal for this demonstrator for Mini Lighthouse is to fire, verify the design that already existed for the factory uh, and test it for the liquid sodium cooling and also the radiation damage. Because the radiation damage, um, of course, is coming from the, radi the activation of uh, the target and the radiation um, changes the characteristics of the materials around it and makes it a lot weaker. Um, next up, I want to show you the design of our setup. And I want to do this schematically from the ground up. So we'll start just basically with our target. It's a molybdenum target and it's about uh, the size of just a few millimeters. Then we shoot at it with an electron beam. And in our case, it's about a 30 kilowatt electron beam. Now, uh, obviously, we have to cool our target. And like Eve just explained, we do this with liquid sodium. So it's a liquid metal, and it flows with a couple meters per second. Now, in the case we just showed, uh, now the beam will just go at least mostly still through our target. And we have to make sure that it gets absorbed by a beam dump. And this is water cooled. Um, Next, this setup yeah, wouldn't work like this because the electrons will mostly get absorbed by air particles. They will either get absorbed or get scattered away and won't hit the target. So both the electron beam and our target need to be in a vacuum environment. And we need to also separate these environments in case that we have a, yeah, a target failure or a leakage of sodium, then the sodium should not be able to go into the beam line. So therefore, we came up with the idea to put a beryllium window there of only 25 microns thick. Um, this actually makes sure that the beam can still go through the window, but at least any uh, particles or liquid sodium or sodium gas cannot go into the beam line. Uh, next up, this whole setup uh, yeah, is shielded around it with a lot of lead and plastics, so uh, polyethylene and borated polyethylene. Together, that's about 7,000 kilos. Um, in our setup, we need to put a lot of diagnostics to make sure that everything uh, 
yeah, it's working as it's supposed to. But we have uh, many temperature sensors and also heaters, you know, indicated with a P, uh, because we need to heat up our setup, that will Eve explain uh, in a bit. Besides these diagnostics, we also had cameras. Actually, two of them, namely, were the infrared camera and the visible camera. Without these cameras, we would basically be blind for a target, and we wouldn't know if anything would go wrong. Um, now, also these cameras had to be additionally shielded with 10 centimeters of lead because just the basic uh, shielding was not sufficient. And that was also clear from the experiment. Um, yeah, fun fact, well, not maybe not so fun, but the infrared camera only survived for one day uh, during the full exposure of 100%. Uh, it was a, a pity, but also very uh, yeah, insightful for our radiation damage. Now this whole setup is put in a nuclear bunker. And this nuclear bunker is uh, situated in uh, Dresden in Germany, uh, where we uh, eventually built this. And in 3D, it kind of looks like this. So in the middle, we see the setup that we've designed with a double cross-section uh, area. The uh, orange part in the middle, that's the vacuum chamber. And inside this vacuum chamber is our target. Then around it, you have the, the gray shaped bricks. That's the, the lead, uh, the lead shielding. And around that is the blue and purple polyethylene shielding. The uh, electrons come into our target with a red arrow the, from the beam line. And the, blick, uh, the big gray box on the left, that's the sodium loop. It's designed by a German company named SAS. Uh, so one of our uh, partners and the electrons uh, so the beam line, basically, that's uh, uh, situated uh, at HITR, the Research uh, Institute in Dresden. There was only one of the about three accelerators in the world that were capable of handling the power that we required. So luckily, it was only in Dresden and not too far away. Um, yeah, so now that we know uh, what our setup looks like, we can go on with uh, how to control the setup. So in the thank you here. So in the following slides, I will explain all the challenges that we faced, and and eventually how we designed all the subsystems of the whole system. So first, as here I told, um, we have to create an ultra high ultra high vacuum because if we wouldn't have this vacuum, too much gas particles will eventually hit the beam, uh, and then the beam would scatter around, and you want to have a high precise uh, beam, so to uh, solve this issue, we have to have an ultra-high vacuum. Uh, here, I also talked about this window that we have in between the vacuum chamber and the beam line. So uh, this window is really tiny. So if you have, would have too much of a pressure difference, this window would break. Now, to solve this issue, we have one general low vacuum. So to create this low vacuum, we have the pre-pump that you see uh, on the bottom. And then once we have this low vacuum, then we have two turbo pumps, so one for each vacuum, to create the high vacuum eventually. So now to put this into practice, you can see here on the right, uh, we have a, schemat uh, a CAT drawing of the sys system, the vacuum system. The orange box is the vacuum chamber. And on the right, you see the tube uh, that comes from HZTR, where the beam comes uh, eventually and hits the target. Now, we have two separate uh, high vacuums. Uh, you see a small tube running uh, below to uh, those two uh, turbo pumps. So those white modules that you see attached uh, to the system are those turbo pumps that we have to eventually create the high vacuum. Now, once we have the vacuum, we also have the beryllium window. And this uh, is to prevent, as Kira told us, this is to prevent the, the, the if, if something, something would go wrong, this would prevent sodium com from going into the beam line. Now, if we would uh, enable the beam now, we would still run into the issue that too much degassing would occur. Now, what is degassing? Degassing is actually um, gas coming out of materials because it gets heated up uh, quickly. Now, to prevent this degassing from happening, we have to preheat the system so that uh, no degassing will occur or a few, as few as possible. Another thing is that we cool with sodium. So because we cool with sodium, we have to preheat the whole uh, system. 
And uh, so to, once we preheat the whole system, then eventually the sodium can run through the whole uh, system. And if things would go wrong, you see a small tube running below this uh, orange box, or so the vacuum chamber. Uh, this also has to be preheated so that all the sodium will eventually drain and stay liquid and fall into the blue box, which we call the catch pan. To be able to heat this uh, vacuum chamber, we added heating tapes on top of this uh, chamber. Uh, and then uh, this enables to preheat the vacuum chamber. And now to eventually uh, heat up the target, we also added two elbow heaters close to the target to heat up those last lines that are in between the target and the, the vacuum chamber. So otherwise, if you wouldn't add this, these two heaters, we would have uh, a risk of clogging. So sodium would solidify because temperatures wouldn't reach uh, too high, a too high temperature. So to solve this, we added those uh, elbow heaters. Now that we have uh, those subtim systems explained, we of course also have to um, control everything. So we used a, a PLC system, a Siemens PLC, to control all the subsystems and to, be, uh, to give the operator or the engineer the option to control everything. We had to design a graphical user interface for, uh, for them to operate all the sus subsystems. And now to explain how the system works, we first have the initializing state. So in this initializing state, we have uh, first, uh, we create the vacuum. And after we create the vacuum, then we would heat up the system. And then in the next state, we could uh, start uh, filling the system with sodium. So then SAS, uh, the other subcontractor, could then uh, start the procedure to fill everything up with sodium. Once that the system is filled up with sodium, we can, the machine gives a go, and then uh, the engineer can then uh, give the command to turn on the beam. Uh, but if we would uh, still, if we would use this uh, scenario, it would be too dangerous because yeah, we're dealing with radiation. So to solve this, uh, or to make the machine safe, we added some safety. So on the right, you see all the, the subcontractors that are uh, in this whole uh, big machine. So we have Demcon, <coughs> sorry, Demcon, SAS, and HZTR. So if uh, SAS wouldn't be able to cool the system, there has to be send a signal quickly to HZTR to turn off the beam, because if they wouldn't do that, uh, the whole target would melt down in a few milliseconds because you have so much heat going into the target uh, so that uh, the beam uh, target would eventually melt down. So you want to prevent this. So the, then you have to turn on off the beam. So this is actually how the whole system works as one. And this was also the biggest challenge uh, for the software part because you have multiple systems. They have to all work together. Then you also have the state machine that enables uh, certain alarms and then everything has to work together. So that was the biggest uh, challenge. So now the, um, the experiments could uh, continue. And yes. here I can uh, yes, explain this. Exactly. So uh, <clears throat> before actually performing the experiment, we could at least build the whole setup in the nuclear bunker, uh, which we've done. You can see it on this picture. The arrow line is uh, the electron beam from HITR that's entering our setup. For our setup, you can mostly recognize uh, the blue bricks, which is the, the lead shielding, and around this there's an aluminum frame, and uh, on top of that there's the black and white uh, uh, polyethylene shielding. Uh, besides there, that there's not much to see because we had to put on yeah, so much shielding for this uh, radiation. Um, and then next up, we did three experiments. The first experiment is the beam alignment, where with the low power, we needed to make sure that the beam was aligning with the target very well. Then the second experiment would be to go from this low power uh, situation to a high power, so 100% beam power situation, and still make sure that uh, all the parameters work uh, as expected. And then the third and final experiment would be an, the endurance experiment, so that would be the, the most important experiment for this setup and um, because the target is there exposed to 100% beam power for 120 hours. So the first experiment, the beam alignment, um, here we look at the difference in temperature of the sodium inlet and the sodium outlet. Now when the beam is off, 
we don't see a difference in temperature. But when we do shine uh, or yeah, irradiate the target with the, the beam, then we get a difference in temperature because the target is absorbing energy. We can scan this beam from uh, the left to the right, for example, and then we get a difference in temperature of the sodium inlet and sodium outlet. Now, this difference in temperature is dependent on the position of the beam. So if we go all the way on the left, it will be less. Uh, on the, in the middle, it will be higher. And on the right, it will be less again. So eventually, we at least expect a symmetrical shape. <clears throat> this is also what we uh, simulated before. Um, so uh, we gave this a try. And in the x position, you can see the position of the beam. And in the y position, you can see the difference of this temperature of the sodium in an outlet. Uh, what we observed was not a symmetrical shape at all. It looked more like some scattered data. And what had to do because of this um, resolution. The resolution was 0.9 uh, degrees C, and it was too big to actually see the details of our target with a scan along the target. Um, so this was yeah, one of the one of the few technical challenges that we uh, that we yeah, faced. And uh, the way we approached it, we had three parameters that we could tweak on to, uh, to make this work. The first one would to decrease the beam size. Now, this works as follows. When we decrease the beam size uh, and still go yeah, for scanning along uh, the target, you can see more details of our target uh, of the geometry. The next step would be to increase the beam power because if when you increase the beam power, then the difference in sodium inlet and outlet temperature gets uh, bigger. You can see uh, a bigger difference. The third one would, to, would be to change or basically increase the resolution of the uh, thermometer. Because the thermometer had only a resolution of 0.9 degrees C, we could ch yeah, change this by a hardware change. The upper two do came with an increased risk. This We had to tweak this to make sure that it worked well because in one instance, it didn't work well. Um, yeah, we tweaked it uh, such that we actually had a sodium leakage from our target. And in the picture, we looked inside the vacuum chamber from the side and then looked downwards. And downwards, uh, there was this flange. And on top of that, there was a yeah, sodium uh, spoils around it. Uh, so we had a sodium leakage. Luckily, we could clean it. Uh, but it uh, was one of the, yeah. One of the things that we noticed that we're working with uh, sodium, which also had some safety regulations with it. Um, so next up, we also increased uh, the thermometer resolution, which uh, Yves can explain. Yes, thanks, Gerard. Um, so currently, we have uh, in the middle, you see an electronic schematic overview of the uh, heating system. On the right, you see the, in the CAT drawing of the heaters who are attached close to the target, so on the elbows. And beneath the CAT design, you can see the heater. So this heater is actually really tiny. Uh, to give perspective, it's only the size um, of a grain of rice. So it's only yeah, maybe uh, smaller than a centimeter in, uh, in length. So it's really tiny. And the challenge here lies uh, with is to, so for the experiment to work, we had to measure the temperature. And the whole system is actually too tiny to put on a thermometer because they yeah, were dealing with radiation. So this would um, be get damaged and eventually break. So we had to get the temperature out of the heater. Now, to get the temperature out of the heater, uh, we actually measure the voltage and the current coming from that the heater is using. Because we know the properties of this heater, we can then uh, derive and calculate the temperature for the heater. Uh, so we have on the left, so in the middle you see the schematic overview of the electronic uh, design. On the left, in the schematic overview, you see the power supply. And this power supply is a, a lab power supply. Uh, so this gets controlled with the PLC. So the PLC then sets a voltage. And then the lab power supply then gets gives a feedback of the current. So once we have the voltage and the current with the uh, Ohm's law, we can then calculate the resistor of the heater and eventually derive the temperature because we know the specs of the heater. Now, unfortunately, as Gerard told us, uh, this didn't work because we have too much, uh, uh, the resolution was actually too low. We only have 0.9 degrees uh, of a difference. 
Now to solve this, uh, we added a new uh, schematic, and in this new schematic, you see a new s uh, resistor that is added in series. Now this new resistor acts as a shunt resistor, so there is current current going through the resistor, and because of Ohm's law, we can then calculate the current w if we uh, measure the voltage over this resistor. So now that we have the current, we simply still need to measure the voltage of the heater. So we then also measure the, directly the voltage on the heater itself. And then we have a more precise measurement of the current and the voltage. And then we can do the same calculations and then calculate what the actual temperature of the heater is. And now uh, this improved our resolution from 0 0.9 degrees to 0 0.03 degrees, which is an improvement of a factor 30. So this would uh, enable this experiment to run more smoothly uh, for, for Gerard uh, to do the experiment. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and it worked. This is what we uh, had before. So uh, yeah, the resolution was uh, too big for <clears throat> for the details that we uh, expected. So we changed all three parameters that I previous, previously mentioned. So the beam power, beam size, and also the, the thermometer. And that resulted in the following picture. Here we can clearly see a symmetrical shape of uh, yeah, the difference in temperature of the sodium when we were scanning with the beam along the tube. This is what we expected. And from this data, we can uh, find the middle and make sure that the beam is shooting in the middle of our target. The next experiment um, is go from this low power, uh, go to 100% beam power. So the beam ramp up. Um, here on the x-axis, you can see the beam power going from 0 to 100. And on the y-axis, again, you can see the difference in temperature of the sodium in an outlet of our target. The blue dots are the experimental values, uh, including their uh, error bars. And the black line is a simulated value, also including confidence bounds. Um, yeah, the two clearly overlap. Uh, the data points uh, overlap uh, most of the time and are definitely within each other's confidence bounds. So uh, we were very confident that at least the setup uh, yeah, works as expected also with very high beam power. And the third experiment is uh, where we kept it at 100% beam power and then yeah, did this for 115 hours in total of irradiation. Um, and the beam was uh, off a couple of times because of some uh, hiccups, but also because of a uh, planned beam off. Now eventually, we were uh, in the beam in the control room for six days, having three shifts a day. And uh, that looked a little bit like this. So on the left side, you have the, the beam line operators of HATR. And on the right side, uh, there's the DEMCON team just sitting there for uh, yeah, six days, three shifts a day, looking at uh, the displays, making sure that everything uh, yeah, worked as expected. It sort of looks like a movie scene. It was an <laughs> interesting experience. And uh, yeah, we did it. Uh, with this, we, uh, yeah, we had 100% beam power as, ex yeah, as planned for 115 hours. And to put it in perspective of what this actually means is um, this graph. So here we have different devices uh, showing on the x-axis the power of this device that it can produce, and on the y-axis, uh, yeah, the parameter that's very interesting for us, namely the power density for a device. And on the lower right corner, there's a solar core. So, of course, the sun has a lot of energy, uh, but actually the power density of it is not even that high. Um, and it is a log-log scale, so a small change is actually quite a big change. More in the middle of the graph is uh, yeah, fusion, uh, where the power density is definitely a bit higher already, and the total power is a bit less, um, but it's uh, getting there. Then, for example, a rocket engine, uh, which is almost at the top, uh, reaching about uh, 10 to the 11th watt per uh, cubic meter. Cubic meter is um, it has a really high power density, and that was about the highest power density that we could find in literature. Uh, yeah, for at least a target that didn't break. And then one order of magnitude higher, that's where our experiment is. Uh, so mini lighthouse and also uh, the lighthouse factory in the future that produce about uh, a bit more than 10 to the 11th watts per cubic meter, meter uh, per cubic meter. 
Uh, this is uh, really a lot. And there's, for example, one like laser cutting, which is uh, the red cross above there, that has a higher power density, but of course this is meant to break something uh, <clears throat> and not to, yeah, to keep it intact like, uh, like our setup. Um, we could not have done this uh, with, our, with our partners, uh, RRE, our customer, but definitely also SAS and HITR for the sodium loop and the, the beam line. Um, <clears throat> we are super happy about this result. Uh, and concluding, what do you think about uh, being part of this project for the couple uh, two years? Uh, well, uh, of course, we face lots of challenges. Um, and we only had, yeah, I only had a, a really a small amount of experience, so it was challenging to uh, and exciting also to find uh, the solutions and directly adapt to make the system work eventually uh, because you only have a few options and you have to solve it quickly because you don't have a lot of time and uh, that was a really exciting and challenging part of the project. And then of course we also have the whole team, so uh, the communication went also really well because we have a young and enthusiastic team which really made it really exciting and everybody was motivated so this in, in, yeah this in general uh, give a give a great vibe of the whole uh, project and you here yeah uh, well I can completely relate to your uh, your story um, but indeed yeah I mean uh, yeah both of us were uh, quite young for me that was uh, is actually my, my first job at Demcon um, but then nevertheless yeah, to be in such a technical, challenge, challenging project and not having that much experience, they, well, they gave us uh, lots of responsibility, but of course, also a team effort, so you're never alone. You do this together uh, with quite a bit of people, actually. Uh, yeah, that's a very cool uh, experience. Also, to be in, in a nuclear bow, a bunker and to build up this setup. Yeah. Actually, two years ago when I joined Temcon, I didn't expect that yeah, we were actually gonna achieve this uh, result. I mean, having such a high power and such a small volume, then cooling with liquid sodium in a vacuum environment and a nuclear bunker, well, that seemed uh, crazy to me. But uh, here we uh, actually did it. We yeah, managed it's crazy. having a world record. Yeah. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.